Hello folks and welcome to our game on this uh, Monday afternoon with myself Shane Stevenson joined as ever by Michael Burney. A reminder we're brought to you by OlgaRetro.com. Use the promo code OurGame and you'll get 15% off any of the brilliant stock. Actually, I think they're running a deal at the moment where all stock is 20% off, so no better time to go checking it than now. We're of course wearing Mayo gear, both jerseys. You can get these at OlgaRetro.com with the news that Lee Keegan sadly has stepped away from inter-county football. I mean, he's going to go down as one of, one of the greats, isn't he? Yeah, he'll go down as one of the greats of, the, of uh, his generation. He'll probably go down as the greatest Mayo footballer of all time, I'd say, as well. Um, do you know what I loved about most was just... Uh, RF had a tweet up there this morning of some of his most inspirational points. It was like six or seven points. Five of them were definitely off the outside of the right foot. That kind of patented shot that he'd take on. But like definitely, I think it was in six of the seven games he took on those scores and got them. They were you know, trailing, they were chasing the game. Jesus, if you ever needed somebody to stand up when things were going wrong. Like you can think of uh, when they played Kildare this year and they were under pressure, he put over a lovely score off his left. Um, he just always stood up, I felt, when they needed him the most. And like, what's neat? He was a classic big game player as well. Mm. Like he, like all those All-Ireland finals, he was absolutely outstanding in nearly all of them. He was the one that was, you know, pushing back against the fading of the light even in some, in some of those games. And thinking of even the, the Tyrone final a couple of years ago as well, when things didn't go well for him. And he just, defiant, defiant is the, the word I probably use to describe him. And it's such a, you can't buy that. And you can't breed that into people. Some people have it, some people don't. Some people maybe get a bit more cuteness and a bit more know-how throughout as their career goes on. But oh, like, what a player. What an absolute player. Uh, and for a defender... As well, like he was a beautiful footballer. He had all of the dark arts, which we'll go into, and all that. But he was a brilliant footballer as well, and had all the skills as well. Yeah, no, I, th- I thought he was excellent. Jack Nolte says here, Legend Lee is what a great. Like if you go over his, his twelve-year career, it's quite something. And largely, he played in the halfbacks, uh, in the fullback li- uh, line as well. He played one hundred and forty times between league and championship, scored eight seventy-one, and in his sixty-seven championship appearance. He uh, scored 7.48, I saw Colin Keyes writing, which is over a point a game, which is unbelievable. For He probably changed how backs played in terms of that bombing forward. Now, I know others did it before him. You know, I even think of Mark O'Shea, Tomas O'Shea, uh, me, and, you know, th- there are plenty who did it. But by God, did anyone do it quite like he did? Yeah, and even just the, like he did, he was able to bomb forward. And, and, and then on the split, and the, the opposite side of that, like, I don't know if he bombed forward at all any of the times he was marking Dear McConnelly. It was like his role was tie him down, do not let him pull the strings. And uh, remember him ask, asking him about that, I think it was at the end of the 2016 season. And I just loved hearing this because I'm a defender, but I just loved hearing what he said. He just was, was talking through his kind of mindset. He just said about the dark arts of marking Dear McConnelly. He just said, he's a quality player, but I don't see why I should let Dear McConnelly run around the pitch and do what he does best. If we did, sure, he'd be kicking six or seven points a game and I'd be looking like a dude out there. I'm a defender. I'm going to try and negate his influence as much as possible. Believe me, I love watching him play when he's in top form, but I'm just there to do a job for Mayo. And if I'm told to mark him or not mark him, that's just what I have to do. Of course, it probably did become a bit personal from other people. uh, But from our point of view, we just want to do what we can do what we can uh, that's best for our teams. He was uh, the lucky one this year that slotted away the winning penalty and I shook his hand afterwards. We have nothing but respect for each other because at the end of the day, we're there to win games and there to win medals and I'm sure he'd say the same thing if he was in uh, this position. So, like, you just do what you have to do in a given day and he would literally, as we saw from, you know, a sneaky little throw of a GPS as well, he would do anything he could and he'd no problem. And for later in that interview that he did in 2016 with me said that it's win at all costs. You do whatever you had to do. Just go into a quote, actually, he was talking about about the win at, win at all costs uh, attitude. Um, he just said, as defenders, you just have to do uh, what other people are not willing to do. I've no beef with that at all. I'm very comfortable in saying that because I'm a defender and when it comes to winning games, I have to stop a forward. You saw Colin Boyle during the year. He took a black card once or twice. That had to be done. That's just the way it is. You win at all costs. And it's so uh, it's so disappointing that for a player that was driven like that, and as much as he lifted Mayo, that they still probably weren't able to get over the line. But like a fantastic career. Did he finish up with six All-Stars, I think it was? Um, something like that. He's only fan, gone 33 yeah. as well since October. He definitely had another year or two in him if he wanted to. But maybe one of those things that, you know, some players go out before there's calls for them to be moved on. 
like he's gone out while he's still highly in the, uh, demand. And you know, you talk about that era where he had those great matchups with uh, Dear McConnelly. He also had some great matchups with Kieran Kilkenny when Kilkenny was playing that sort of. I think the the term Colin Nally, the former Mead coach, uses that sort of swinger player who moves the ball around from one edge of the pitch to the other. And uh, sure, Connolly had brilliant performances on him. Remember against Michael Quinlevin in the All Ireland semi final. Uh, didn't he mark Sean Kavanagh that same year as well? Yeah. He just had so, so many good performances. And also around that era, there was the whole trend online, things that Lee did, more or less that he was at fault for anything. And just to go through some of them here. So I met up with Morris Deegan during the week to get his yellow card, hashtag uh, things Lee did. Killed your man Escobar with a 45, hashtag uh, things Lee did. Headbutted his marker straight into the fist, hashtag Oh Jesus! This one, Lee took <laughs> Lee, Lee King took my virginity and never gave it back. Hashtag things Lee did. So like some of them are very very funny. Junior Z Hurler says Lee a great player and a right pain in the arse from a Dublin perspective. Grodo go crack on adds I'd hoped he wouldn't be, but he would be the greatest ever player never to win in All Ireland, and he always played at his best in every final. There's no higher compliment than that that you're always playing the best even when your team isn't. Uh, ML89, Mayo's greatest. Not all Mayo lads uh, that can say that they won their individual matchups in every All-Ireland he played in. Outscoring Dear McConnelly over three All-Ireland finals was fair going. It really was. Yeah, just on the... Maybe had another year. Maybe he did. But I remember a couple of years ago, Shane, uh, when he was in kind of fullback slash cornerback where Con gave him an awful lot of trouble in that All-Ireland final. Remember, he slipped him for two goals. Mm. There was probably a lot of people... They had wondering. huge injuries, though, that year. Like, the, there was eight or nine Mayo... And, you know, they weren't as competitive as they normally were. No, true enough. But people were looking at uh, at Keegan and saying that... Like, he did probably look uh, maybe a bit more than when he would be out wing-back. He was just caught a bit flat-footed a couple of times. People were questioning whether he'd be able to, you know, hit the heights that he had. He was Football of the Year in 2016. But, like, to me, like, probably... His best ever season was probably 2021, realistically. It was just an unbelievable season. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, pure Hatchet Shane, are you involved with the Black Rock Hurlers in Cork? Uh, funnily enough, I got a text from someone in Cork the other day saying, congrats on getting involved with Black Rock and Cork. And I was like, what? So I presume it's uh, Shane Stapleton from Golden, perhaps, who's involved with them. So I'm not sure about that. Uh, but uh, maybe other people, some Cork people might know that for sure. Joe Butler, Lee was one of the reasons why I watch Gaelic Footballer. Simply a great player. Um, just then, some other bits of news from the last couple of days. The Tipperary senior football manager, David Power, he's confirmed that 2016 All-Star Michael Quinlan is not part of his Tipperary panel going forward. And it's just a couple of days after Colin O'Reardon uh, confirmed that he was going back to Australia, which is um, you know a huge blow, a double blow really for Tipperary because both of those are key players and certainly were in 2020 when a monster title uh, was delivered. Also, Brian Cody, he's back in management. I suppose it's no real surprise, is it really, Michael, that uh, Brian Cody is back with uh, James Stevens. He was involved last year anyway, and he and uh, so he's back in again. No real surprise there. One thing I'd heard before is, uh, you know, when he was previously in charge of the village before taking over Kilkenny, that, you know, to be impossible to ever get him out of that job, and obviously the Kilkenny job was the one way that you would, and he's straight back in there again. Yeah, not 100% confirmed, but set set to be confirmed. It's only, it, by, from what, by all accounts, from what I understand, it's only it's only a matter of time and crossing a few T's and dotting a few I's. But yeah, he was at manager of the village in the mid-90s. I think uh, I think Young Ireland's beat him in 96 in a county final when he was manager. And yeah, whoever said that, they weren't too far wrong because once he get it, went in with Kilkenny, he ended up there across four decades and across 24 seasons. And I think once it... Uh, when you have someone like that available to you within your club, it's only a matter, you know, it's only natural that they're gonna end up uh in that type of a role. And uh he can't he can't get away from it. You know, when you spend that much time involved in hurling between your own playing career, managerial career, like it's something like he knows hurling and management inside out. So it's not something that he looks like he's gonna get away from anytime soon. No, some week for Ruben Halloran. So he scored seven points in his Watford debut against Tip last week. So brilliant freeze actually that day. And then he scored 114, all 114 that De La Salle got, beating Abbeyside to win the Watford under 28 county uh, hurling title. So Davy Fitz seems like, it seems like he has a serious talent on his hands there. Big time. And I think one of the key things on that is that they beat Ballygunner. Uh, they beat Ballygunner in one of the divisional finals along the way. So 
uh, I, I don't know, Ballygunner had hoovered up nearly every title there was, including the including the intermediate, and they were beaten, I think, in the junior B final. They obviously won the senior and won Munster senior as well. So a good sign from a De La Salle point of view. This is their next senior team coming now with the likes of Ruben Halloran and those guys who are going to be of age now. So maybe, uh, I remember saying it to John Milan uh, last year, maybe I said, I said, looking at what Liz Moore have with Jack Prendergast and Carrick Daly, Irla Daly, and even Morris Shannon. And I remember saying, this more are, the, are the, probably the ones, he said, the coming team. And what? He says, ah, come on now, Verdi. He said, we're the coming ones. You know what I mean? Like, like he, And he obviously knew that there was a good team coming there. So that's probably going to form the, the bulk of their senior team, along with uh, Sean O'Brien, Shane McNulty, uh, Jack Fagan, uh, etc. Kevin Moore, I'm sure, is st- I'm sure, is still going as well. So... Uh, a huge, a huge, uh, a huge thing for Dennis Al, and obviously, yeah, brilliant performance from Ruben Haller and Kappen, uh, an unbelievable week for him. Okay, so I've a comment here from M- ML89. I'm not going to bring up on screen and see if other viewers have the answer. Only one man scored more goals past Stephen Cluxon during his career than Lee Keegan. He scored three goals against the Dubs. Name that player, and I presume this is championship goals. So you, I know you can see the answer already. Yeah, no, I knew, I knew it anyway. This is a great question. I went down to Tony Doran's quiz down in Buffers Alley, and he pulled out this question, and I said, "There must be a reason why. There must be a, you know, a reason locally why he's asking this question." And it obviously is someone from the the sunny southeast, but it's probably not the player uh, most people would think. Yeah, um, uh, TOS1986 says, watch Thursday's show, we were talking about rule changes, and he says, one rule change I'd love to see would be a stopped clock, GA catching up with the LGFA 25 years later, so if you have any other suggestions in terms of um, rule changes, let us know, and actually... Just on that, Shane, in- I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, uh, that wasn't the way I went with my three wishes, but, like, looking at rule changes and things that need to change... Like the idea of the the black card in football and the All Ireland semi final last year, where the ball was in play for about four minutes of the ten, where where Dublin had a black card, like that seriously has to be looked at. Even if it's just you know the only role of somebody is stopping and starting and making sure that the ball is in. You know you know what I mean. It's just you can't be able to run down the clock like like they did. That would definitely be another one as well. And another one of my wish list, I should have said, that goalkeepers remain on their line throughout 2023 <laughs> because I'm sick of keepers leaving their line and the ball been, you know, tapped into a, an open net, which happens way too much for my liking. No, I want keepers to continue coming out and uh yeah, attacking. I think it's brilliant. Brilliant. Thing. Oh no, 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 um, no. I've no I've no issue with the that attacking point of view. A keeper a keeper joining his full back under a high ball against the full Oh yeah. Ball, yeah, I, that drives me bonkers and leaving the net free. At no stage should the net the net be left free unless you're completely in in possession and in control of the play. Actually, seeing as you mentioned that, I had a bit of a chance to watch some of Leash's match with Wexford, which was in the um the O'Burn Cup. Is it the O'Burn Cup? It Walsh is Cup. the O'Burn Sorry, the Walsh Cup. Um, from yesterday. It was in Mount Rath. Now, it, it was slightly hard to tell from the, the the angle, but I think that there's Astro in the just in the goals around the square or whatever. But one long free went in, I think from Damien Reck, and uh, Ender Rowland came out for the high ball up against the full back and the full forward. They all missed it. So it looked like, you know, obviously heavy enough sod at the moment that would have bounced and just dribbled into the net. It hit the Astro and ended up bouncing over the bar. Boy. Isn't that an interesting yeah. one there? Yeah, I'll tell you something. If I, if I was with him, I'd be going bonkers. If if the keeper is going up, the fullback has to not be contesting the ball and has to be just marking his man to me. But I just, I think, I think the fullback goes up and it, if it breaks to the keeper, it breaks to the keeper. But I just don't think, um, I don't think everybody should be under the high ball. And I never, ever, ever leave that line free and leave an open goal. Yeah, so uh, James S says Vernie's wish that he was an actual Kilkenny man. No, I'm an awfully man and I always will be and I never want to be from anywhere else. Uh, Paul Scully, there is Astro there, Shane, in both goal modes. Yeah, I was thinking otherwise there's no way that the ball would have bounced like that. Just on that, Shane, as well, there was a right crowd in Mount Rat. There was a right crowd in Callan where I was yesterday. There was a right crowd in Nina. There was 4,000 odd up uh, at a McKenna Cup match during the week. Is the split season making inter county even more appetizing now? I'm wondering because there's definitely, like, I don't know, there's a good buzz around county starting mm-hmm. back. I'll tell you what, as well, there's a good buzz because a couple of years ago it had gone to, like, I remember, I think Kildare, Kildare's winter training ban finished. 
like the day before they were supposed to be back playing before and did a burn cup game in the middle of December. I think people were getting sick of that kind of carry on and the inter-county season get starting quicker and quicker. But I think New Year, the amount of people that are out and mad to go to matches, mad to see their county. And it's, it's, you know what I mean? Everyone seems to be refreshed after almost like a sufficient break. That's what it looks like to me anyway. Yeah, and there's a tweet here from Richard Hogan. Why was Peter McDonald taken off yesterday? He suffered a shoulder injury, wasn't it? Jeff? Yeah, he looked like a bad enough shoulder injury. Um, they, had, they had a couple of injuries yesterday. Now, Conor Heary went off as well, injured. Um, so that was probably, you know, it was a good win for Kilkenny, but uh, Peter McDonald definitely would have been one of the players that Derek Ling would like to have a good look at over the, the Walsh Cup and maybe, maybe during the league, but probably unlikely uh, now at this stage. It's an awful time to pick up. Listen, there's no good time to pick up a belt but when you're an emerging player trying to make a bit of a breakthrough. You know, his opportunity could be gone for this year now, realistically. Yeah, quite a few of the least pitches are similar. Cam Ross and Clock Balakala, they're the same as Paul Scully, obviously relating to the Astro. Uh, we'll talk about the Munster Hurling League. Tipperary had been beaten last week by Waterford, but had a 222 to 20 points win over Clare inside Nana, abroad in, uh, in McDonough Park. Uh, just to go through who did some of the scoring, uh, Grodo O'Connor, he scored eight points, one of those from play. Jake Morris scored a point, won two penalties. Sean Ryan scored 1-1. One, one. Uh, Connor Stakelham scored, scored a couple of points as well. For Clare, uh, Peter Duggan, he scored five, a point uh, coming from a penalty. Mark Rogers scored three, and Robin Mounsey scored four points. So a couple of other players pitching in as well. So I think it's kind of important for Tipperary and Cahill because it's Cahill's first win as Tipperary manager. His last win was uh, April 17th last year against Tipperary and Munster. And Tipperary's last competitive victory, if you can call the Munster Hurling League uh, a competitive fixture, was against Antrim last March. So, yeah, you can say that these are meaningless competitions if you like. But number one, the performance was encouraging. And number two, it is good to get a win on the board, even if it is a somewhat experimental clear team. A hundred percent. And like, as, as I said about crowds earlier, decent crowd uh, turned up in McDonough Park to, to see Tip on home soil for their first game and see uh, Liam Cahill and co um, playing on home soil in their first, or managing on home soil for the first, you know, the first time. And they got the result they wanted. I'd say more importantly, whatever about the result. And when you look at how many days it had been since the win, the result probably was important. But the performance was far more encouraging, I would say. The bits I saw of it anyway, the, the speed on show, the athleticism on show, the work rate on show, I'd say too, breaking the lines. Uh, I think it was Alan Tynan went through for that goal, you know, broke a couple of tackles, offloaded it lovely and, you know, a beautiful finish as well. But... Probably not something that we have seen it with Tip in the last couple of years, maybe that type of direct, strong running. So that was definitely one encouraging aspect from the highlights I saw. Well, you think about it, he's a rugby player. He's used to running these direct lines and trying to cut through traffic and, and make breaks. So I like and in some ways you'd think, okay, he's maybe five foot ten or something like that. And the thing these days is to have big monsters if you can, six foot five, six foot four players like you'd see regularly in the Limerick team. So he's not huge. But if you're a sort of lad who can get in behind uh, the opposition, then that's very important. So he set up that goal for, uh, and he waited. You know the way in rugby, they yeah. sort of say, fix the man before you, you know, so he obviously taken him out of the play and then gave a lovely switch hand pass in for Sean Ryan, who finished very, very well. So he's been playing very well for Temple Derry the last couple of years. So Alan Tynan looks a real positive at the moment. Sean Ryan does. As, uh, as we see in a comment here from, let me just find it. There's a comment from somebody talking about, Michael Verney looking, or sorry, Michael Breen, I should say. Lee Manton here says, Michael uh, Breen looks the part at fullback for Tipperary. Interestingly, Seamus Kendi was named at wing forward. Mm. So, like, to me, Seamus Kendi's brilliant athlete. He's obviously got the footballer mindset, as well as being a great hurler, but he's got the footballer mindset. He's able to carry the ball at pace. So you, you might get an idea of what they're trying to get from him. Because, you know, at the start of the year, you might have thought Michael Breen would play wing forward and maybe Seamus Kennedy would be in fullback, but kind of the other way around. Um, and there, there's plenty of other positives there. Uh, Jake Morris winning two penalties. I mean, that, that's obviously a bit of a positive. Grodo O'Connor is coming on a little bit. Um, but like 15 whites for Clare. So obviously they left a bit behind them. They underperformed to some degree. And like the, there are a lot of new enough players getting game time. Dermot Ryan came on. Looks massive. I don't know when you're, when you're looking at that clip of him popping over one of the points. He looks like he's physically um, filling out that bit more again. Like, Claire could be going to be too bothered by this. No, definitely not. And I, we said it on Thursday's show, the benefit of Tipperary having a game under their belt, you can you can do all the training you want, but 
that bit of, you know, that getting through that heavy ground, playing a game against Waterford the other night. Uh, and I know it wasn't all the same personnel that togged out again, but there was a decent few of them. Um, and like in horse race and parlance, they would have come on for the run an awful lot. You have that under your yeah. belt and it would have helped an awful lot. Uh, the Kennedy one at wing forward is interesting. Um, I would totally reserve judgment on that until you see them against, you know, uh, in a league game maybe. But Paddy Deegan was wing forward for Kilkenny yesterday as well, which I thought was interesting. And he spent most of the game coming back into the half-back line and John Donnelly was playing centre forward, did something similar as well. It was really about uh, nearly being extra defenders when they didn't have the ball, which I thought was interesting. So that's something that Derek Ling is obviously looking at and it's something that Liam Cattle is looking at with Seamus Kennedy too. Did you notice much in games that you watched over the weekend? Now, I was in at Dublin Antrim, and we'll come to that a little bit later, but teams playing regularly enough with maybe 13 players in their own half when they're defending. And I, and I mean both teams at times doing that. Ah, yeah. Kilkenny did that regular enough. There was definitely, definitely remained. Billy Drennan stayed inside. There was probably one more inside, but a lot of the time there was no half forward line. There was nearly no midfield. The midfielders were nearly half backs. The half forwards were all the way back. Yeah, and that that's that's the way a lot of the time. And if you are able to uh, cause a turnover, hoover up a bit of possession, work a couple of quick passes, bang, there's a load of space inside. Um, but that's kind of that's kind of the way it's going now, isn't it? Again, yeah. probably is starting to mirror football a bit to to some point, but obviously you can move the ball a lot quicker in hurling. So there's even more advantages if you can turn the ball over or uh, get quick puck outs or whatever into that space that's created. Yeah, that's where you need players who are very good in the transition and good at kind of breaking lines and running at pace. So um, and also players who are if they're operating a little bit deeper and you do win a turnover that they're clever with the ball, that they don't just turn it up and blast it aimlessly, that they're looking for someone off their shoulder who's coming and changing the angle. Just on that as well, and it's maybe because we're high up, we can see it a lot a lot more, but particularly inexperienced players or maybe more old school players who are struggling to adapt to that. You know, when you get a ball in traffic, like you need to turn away from the traffic. You know, there could be 12 bodies on the sideline in front of us when a ball breaks there. If you're able to win the ball, you pop it back, you probably work it to the far side where there's a load of space. But the worst thing you can see happening with some players is, particularly players who aren't maybe au fait with how uh, the manager wants them to play, they turn back into traffic and they get turned over themselves again. But it's the, it's the easiest thing to do uh, just to go look for where the traffic is, but you're almost looking for the space now. And that's where a lot, Limerick do it really, really well. They get the ball, they transition, really quick stick pass. All of a sudden, it's over the far corner into Galan or into Peter Casey or whoever it is. Um, but yeah, it's um, definitely teams adopting that more defensive approach. Uh, has definitely been seen in a couple of games I watched anyway. Yeah, so get your comments in while we're still talking about Tipperary and Clare. What did you see from both teams that you liked or didn't like? Ian O'Donovan says, great to see the service the forwards were getting yesterday for Tip. Also great to see the honesty of effort from all the panel, a real uh, Tipperary of old. If we re replicate that week in, week out. Also, Liam is bringing back what Tipperary were always famed for, a bit of dog, a bit of attrition, and above all, work rate, which has deserted us of late. Great to see an energetic-looking Tip team. Jason, yeah, according to you, Shane, Tip are just known for skill and nothing else. Tipper back, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I did a poll yesterday, our tip back. Yes, yes, but more yes. And uh, it was fairly 50 50. Uh, Ian adds that only area for improvement for me was on one or two occasions our halfbacks were sucked up the field or down the field and didn't hold their zones. A strong, clear team would have exploited that. But uh, like within, like, one of the things that Tipperary needed was just that bit more structure. So, I mean, you think last year against Clare in the Munster Championship, how often was the team like, you know, Two thirds of the team out past the sixty-five, and I remember John Connellan was able to solo through for that goal chance earlier on, which was batted in on the rebound. Tipperary were all over the place, completely capitulated against Cork in the final game in Munster. I mean, you just can't have that. So it, there are signs that um, that Liam Cahill's making a bit of an impact already. It wasn't brilliant against Waterford last Wednesday or Tuesday, was it? But still, uh, it's improving. And Adrian McGrath, Clareman says, Tip don't have def defensive options to afford Kennedy up front in the long run. Um, well, given that they're without three defensive starters from last year, you would kind of have to, you know, there'd be some credence to what Adrian has said, but maybe, I don't know, you just don't know, um, there's a lot of things, like Park Walsh was back wing back for Kilkenny yesterday, Paddy Deegan's up front, like in a couple of weeks, would that still be the same? In a couple of weeks, when Tip maybe lose maybe another defensive option or something happens mid-game, will Kendi have to go back into defence? We don't know, and I suppose you don't know the 
mentality or the mindset of management, whether they're just going with this and they're going with someone up front for the year or whether it's just a bit of an experiment. And I suppose, listen, that's what these competitions are for, the experiment and see does something work, um, see does something stick. Yeah, River Power says, Peter Duggan, very lucky to get away with a very bad pull on O'Mara. O'Mara, very lucky not to break an arm. Like a couple of years ago, he missed out on championship time because of a broken arm. So he'll be hoping that he doesn't get any more of those. He was black carded actually for um, dragging someone down for a penalty towards the end of the first half. Connor Bow is really bulked up, says Liam Manton. The clear half back line couldn't handle Garoto O'Connor under the high ball, says Ashley Bentley. Um, there's a question there about Dublin. We'll come to that a little bit later on, and there's a few more. Keep the comments coming in. It's very, very early to we assume in Tipperary have multiple options at three and six. They had no option at three last year. But as I've been saying for the last six or seven years, Michael Breen is the obvious option. Well, listen, they've, I suppose when we're talking about uh, defensive options, they've taken a number 10 or 12 or an eight or nine and moved it back to three, and they've maybe swapped Seamus Kendi up the other end. But... Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see that Breen does look like I'd say that was a bit of a statement and it does look like they're going to go with him there barring like there's a couple of catastrophic moments or whatever but he had played there uh, a bit at underage so and he has he's like he's fast enough that you know he could stay you know stay with Kyle Hayes to a fair degree which very few people very few other people would be able to do um he's good on the ball big physical presence um you're only going to really know probably when there's two inside and there's a heap of space, which you hope there won't be in a big championship game. But he definitely has a lot of the assets for that position. I suppose the dark arts and things like that, when you've been a forward all your life, it'd be interesting to see you know, the little tug here or there, you know, being cute in those kind of situations because it's dog eat dog when you're inside and you have to do whatever it takes to survive. So it'd be interesting to see if Michael Breen adapts to that. Hmm. Do you want to go through some of what Liam Cattle said afterwards? Yeah, sure he will. Um, so he had a couple of things to say, even about the, the strong home support. He just said, delighted to see the big tip following out today. Absolutely thrilled to see the tip tip people back, supporting the lads again. Uh, <laughs> he corrected himself fairly quickly. Not that they ever didn't support him. So if he, had, if he hadn't put that in at the end, people would nearly be saying that he was having a go at the tip support who maybe didn't come out in big numbers last year. Uh, and he just said about John McGrath possibly playing a part this year. So I think it's kind of, had been broadly assumed maybe that, that McGrath would be under pressure maybe to play this year. But I think, I don't know about you, when I saw him listed on the, the squad for the year, I kind of thought, obviously, they think he's going to see some action here. But Carl said he'd have a chance. He's progressing nicely. John has a lot of work put in. Uh, that was a fairly horrific injury he got, but he's on the mend and on the way back. Like An Achilles injury is a career ender uh, for, you know, I know a lot of track and field athletes who rupture your Achilles and you're gone because you've lost that kind of bounce um he he didn't totally rule out Barry Heffernan and, and Craig Morgan I think from featuring but I think both are realistically both are very unlikely um both happened they both got injured during club action the yeah. time it's just it's just not enough like six months would be like the very 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 minimum nine months it would be standard and a lot of guys take maybe up to about a year so I I can't see them featuring yeah, I think Heffernan's happened that bit earlier in the summer than Morgan's. It would be very, very difficult to imagine Mor Morgan would get back. But they're definitely two of Tipperary's best six back, so it's a big blow. Harburn six with a bit of a sneer at me. Looking forward to seeing the Saints name in the program as selector for Tip. Breen full back his first move. Uh, whatever about uh, Tip winning the All-Ireland already this year, but Shane ha still hasn't shaved the beard. Now, to be fair, Michael, I was going to do it this morning. Well, you were going to do it after I told you you had to do it. You weren't going to do it independently. Like, you know, when you, you lose a bet, you you back up whatever the stakes were in the bet. I'm just glad it, there wasn't money involved and I'm not, like, waiting to, get <laughs> bread on my, waiting to get bread on my table or something because I might still be waiting and I'd be starving. But that has to happen soon. Yeah, well, look, I just, I don't actually have a razor because I just used the electric razor for years. But I went down to do it. You know, there was good faith involved. I'd forgotten about it. There was good faith and then I realized near a razor. But I will do it. I will do it. Uh, Adrian McGrath says, I agree. Ari Breen. Vernie is wrong. Tip has spent six years playing a three at ten, not the other way around. Well, I, I'm not sure what he's trying to say. So... so do you see Breen as naturally a fullback who was put up the field? Or do you... I honestly, Shane, you've probably seen more of him. I haven't seen enough of him. Um, I tell you what, he's a natural score taker when he's on the ball. So there's definitely there definitely is an attacking edge. I like I'm not not going to be smart. You would have seen more of him at underage level and maybe seen him play in the backs. So I've never seen him play in the backs before. So I can't really say that uh, 
I can't really say that he's a natural tree or that he was always a tree or a tailor-made tree. That remains to be seen from my point of view because I just don't have enough prior knowledge of him playing in the backs. Yeah, Tip need Ronan out in the half-back line so that he can score. He's wasted at full-back. Well, I'd be concerned if whoever's in uh, the half back line is taking on too ma- too many shots because you know nothing kind of gets me gets my goat more than shots from 100 yards grand having one or two if you're on your own but not too many please uh shane buy him a load of uh, a loaf of brioche to keep him sweet there's, a bit, yeah, there's, a, bit, there's oh. a bit of a there's a bit of a kind of a it's not a metaphor or whatever but obviously brioche is very sweet <laughs> yeah um this a very sad note over the weekend that uh, journalist and commentator potty palmer passed away Really, really devastating news there. R.I.P. Paddy Palmer says, um, "Pure Hatchet," and absolutely, we send our condolences to his friends and families because absolutely horrible what happened, and uh, just a lovely man. Anytime I came across him, yeah, just so well known uh, and well got down around the side. Um, brilliant commentator, brilliant journalist as well, and would it, it's 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 so it's so strange like to. To, to think that Potty is gone because you'd see him regularly tweeting about different things, anything to do with, with Cork. I think he was actually from, uh, I think he was actually from Kerry, uh, but he lived in Cork for the, for the last good while. Um, just such sad news. And yeah, send our condo- deepest condolences to his friends and family. And I suppose the, the wider GA family down there as well, because he would have touched, would have touched so many people. Yeah. And like so often, I'd take what he tweeted over the weekend, something through a cork, and work it into the show because he always had great nuggets of information. So, I mean, all, that aside, that's just the kind of work inside of the man, but just seemed to be a gent. And uh, that was echoed by anyone who ever, um, basically, who, who did uh, give tributes to him over the weekend. A um, little note then, slightly di- uh, completely different topic. Uh, Aaron Glan, he scored a goal for, uh, who was a Creed Celtic. Came on, put them 3 0 up against Bresca Rovers in the Limerick Desmond Premier Division. Uh, the Limerick Hurlers, I think they're just coming back from their holiday now as well. So it'll be interesting to see if he's involved next weekend in the um, in the Munster Hurling League. Are they out against um, Cork next weekend? It is, isn't it? They're playing Cork in the first round of Munster League, and then they're playing Cork in the first round of the league as well. I think it's the 4th of February. Um, so, yeah, listen. Listen, Shane, there's all sorts of different rumours swirling around about, you know, his future with Limerick or that. I think we're probably only going to find out over the over the coming week or 10 days. And I suppose the first time John Kiley talks, we'll, we'll find out uh, what the scenario is there. Yeah, we're not going to add to any rumour that's flying around at the moment. Uh, big win for Derek, or Derek Ling in the sense that he wants to get things going on the, on the right footing. Now, it was a somewhat experimental uh, Kilkenny team, of course. Some lads have gone, gone abroad. Plenty of lads who played in the All-Ireland weren't featuring. Obviously, the Ballyhale lads aren't there. But as the game wore on, I think there was like five of last year's All-Ireland final team uh, on the field at different stages. A 219 to 21 points win over Offaly. So huge for you as a massive Kilkenny man to, to get that victory. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a, yeah, they had a decent bit of experience. They had Hugh Lawler at fullback. Darren Brennan's obviously not played that much in championship, but he's got plenty of experience and played there a couple of years ago when O Murphy was injured. Killian Buckley was, was at six and he was captain in the team. John Donnelly at 11, Paddy Deegan at 12. Um, Bill Sheehan who re- returned to the squad on the back of his farm with Dixborough was inside and was quite good as well the experienced players were probably the, the best players on the day and Kilkenny got a big bounce off the bench as well when Offaly uh, closed I think when it was when they got a back level or maybe Billy Drennan had gotten a free to put Kilkenny back one ahead Mikey Butler came in uh, corner back now he gave away a couple of balls which is unlike him Parik Walsh came in at wing back uh, got on a couple of balls uh, Niall Brennan was introduced early in the, fir- in the first half. He hit two points from distance. Nice ball striker, isn't he? Yeah, lovely ball striker, yeah. And even I was just sitting beside Nicky Brennan, who, who'd know the scene well down in Kilkenny. And any time he took on a shot, he fancied him to score. So he's obviously seen him seen him uh, do plenty of it. I think he's this downy. Um, and the, Tom Phelan came in and got a crucial goal then. I think it was in the 58 or 59th minute. But Kilkenny looked like they were going to like coast away uh, midway through the first half. Uh, Ian Byrne took a shot that was yeah was probably going over. I don't know if it was going over the bar or whether Eamon Cleary tried to pull it down, but he pulled it down and brought it into the net. It was very soft. That put Kilkenny six up. They hit the next two points for one eight to three up, and you're just thinking, ah, uh, like there could be ten or fifteen. Did you fear the worst, yeah. Ah, uh, you would, yeah. But um, that, that's not just that's not. It's just because usually when there's that, you get the sense of blood. They usually will kick on. But in fairness, awfully struck back well. Killian Kylie was good at eleven. Uh, hit two points from play in the first half was brilliant on his freeze hadn't missed a free up until Ridiculous. the hour mark and then 
unfortunately, when his accuracy was probably most needed, it deserted him. I think he missed three or four in the closing mi minutes. Charlie Mitchell, who came on and did well as well from Kilcormack too, he had scored a point, but put one wide and had a couple of Kylie's frees went over. And maybe that effort from Mitchell, there would have only been a point or two in it, whereas we were probably trying to scramble, looking for a goal at, at the latter stages of the second half and couldn't really get the ball um, in around the mixer. I just love get the ball in there. We were trying to maybe work it too much. Just get the ball in around the house and see if you can see if you can uh, make something happen. Now, Darren Brennan had made a really good save uh, earlier on in the first half, and I think Paddy Clancy missed the, missed the rebound. But on the balance of play, Kilkenny were probably three or four points the better team. Billy Drennan started really, really well. He had three points in the opening, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, but I don't know if he was he was kind of sussed out thereafter. Um, predominantly left-sided, really good player, but predominantly left-sided. And the Offaly lad started bringing him to the left side and with a couple of balls he got, and he even got flicked away by Dara Matter, flicked the ball off his hurl at one stage. Um, but he is still under 20 this year, so he's definitely... Uh, Definitely a bright prospect. Um, him and Niall Brennan, I'd say, would have been the two of the newer faces maybe that stood out the most for Kilkenny anyway. Yeah, Joe Butler says a very good showing from Offaly, very competitive. Looking at the game on Clubber, it appeared as if Offaly were the better side, did most of the hurling. Now, I just thought early on that Offaly were turned over just a bit too often when they went for short pockets. Obviously, that is the way the game is now, and you have to be able to do that, but it was somewhat costly, including that Ian Byrne goal. Ah, it was, yeah. There was definitely... Could have been three puckouts in a row, I think, short ones that were turned over and all sent back with interest, um, sent back with interest over the bar. So, like, yeah, I know you're trying to play to a plan or whatever, but it's not as if it was a really dominant Kilkenny half back then. It was a good half back then of Conor Heary, uh, Killian Buckley, and Des Dunn as one of our, as Martin Costo mentions there. But we had, like, we a couple of rangy enough kind of half hours that we could have put the ball down on a bit more, maybe. Um, but we are, I think we're trying to play the right way. I'll put it to you that way. And um, we're trying to work the ball through the lines. We're trying to, um, you know, as I said to you earlier, when we're in traffic, we're trying to find where the space is. We're trying to get the ball to our shooters. Uh, David Nally put over two lovely points near the end to keep us kind of in contention. That's probably going to be one of the best games that we will get all year. We've Wexford next weekend in, in Brennan's Park. Outside of that, we're going to be playing Division 2A hurling and we're going to be playing uh, Joe McDonough Cup hurling. But I was definitely, um, I wouldn't say in twos, but definitely encouraged, I would say, anyway, by the show for, for the first game of the year. Yeah, and most of the players that I saw, and you, you know, you'd see this across the board, there's plenty of mistakes, like Killian Buckley is sitting there at six and he's getting in the right place to get the ball, but sometimes it wasn't going where it should. David Nally had plenty of mistakes early on also, but of course he does plenty of good stuff too. How close is this to a full-strength Offaly team? Um, so, like, who else does Johnny uh, Kelly have to come in? I know Oshin Kelly, sorry, Oshin Kelly came in full forward as well uh, later on in the game. It, was it last year he was out with the injury, wasn't it? Yeah, good to see. Great to see Oshin back. Um, he hadn't played for Offaly since the Christy Ring Cup final. I think he scored seven from play that day. Um, great to see him back. He missed all last year with the Crucid. Good to see Kelly and Kylie back. Ben Keneally wasn't playing, who would be three or six. Uh, and Owen Cattle was out injured as well with his back. I think Ben's a knee injury. Uh, he'd probably be one of our best forwards and probably our free taker as well. So, like, outside of that, not too many more. Stephen Corcoran came on a half-time in goals for Eamon Cleary and looked really, really assured. He'd probably be a good bit more experienced. He'd be up around the 30 mark. Uh, was really assured under the high ball. I'd say, you know, four to five players maybe will come into the Offaly team. Maybe like say Evan Kelly as well from Lusma. Uh, but we wouldn't have been missing. Uh, we wouldn't have been missing a huge amount, you know. Um, and we obviously <laughs> had the benefit of a challenge game before Christmas as well, same as Tipperary. <laughs> no, <laughs> no other team played them. No, uh, Martin Costello with very little hurling on either side. Offaly should take a huge amount of heart from that display. Do you like? Yeah, you said you're you're a little bit encouraged. Just you're, on that um, as well. Just on that as well. Johnny Kelly kind of, uh, and I'm really delighted to hear this. He said they've made you know a really concerted effort about the tackle and when they don't have the ball to make sure they're staying low on the tackle to not be leaving hurls in and they you know they didn't um I think Billy Drennan ended up with five frees and 165 um and I think he missed a free late on whereas Killen Kylie had 10 frees and missed three or four late on so that's if you're talking about not giving away a scoreable frees like you you would have brought it up several times about our discipline and I would have always said that like I don't particularly like how club hurling is refereed within Offaly 
uh, compared to maybe how inter county uh, games are refereed, you can get away with stuff at club hurling that you will not get away with at county. And then when lads go from club to county, they're doing the same things, and all of a sudden they're been blown for it at county level. So it was great to hear that they're making a really concerted effort to try and be as smart and astute as possible in that tackle. Yeah, Derek Ling said he got the Brian Cody seal of approval. He goes, uh, he rang me to congratulate me when I got appointed and I did speak with him. Obviously, it would be foolish not to speak with him and anybody that was involved last year to get their thoughts on how the panel were performing and their thoughts on some of the players as well. Obviously, we've come in with our own ideas and we'll look at the players ourselves. We've taken on the same panel that was involved last year to give them a fair chance. With the club matches, we brought in a number of people as well. So we're, uh, we're trying to get a look at everybody. Timmy Clifford came in as well. He popped a, a point or two also, didn't he? Timmy uh, Clifford popped the point, yeah, yeah. So who of the new brigade stood out to you? Uh, the new brigade for Kilkenny? Mm. It, there was flashes from, from Billy Drennan, but I'd probably like to see a lot more, but that maybe will only come with experience. Uh, Niall Brennan was definitely one. Uh, it was the subs, really, that, that made the difference. An awful lot of new faces. Tom Phelan is not, not that new because he obviously started against Wexford last year, but I thought he took his goal really, really well. Um, yeah, what did you make of David Blanchfield in midfield? I don't like him at midfield. If I'm if I'm being honest, I don't like I like him. Uh, I like him a lot as a player, but I prefer him at wing back. To be honest with you, and it was it was it was funny. I just commented to Nikki, who was sitting beside yesterday as well. Jesus, the differences between what you can do at this stage of the year and what you're hoping a lad will do in May or June. Like with the best will in the world, unless unless you planted your feet and got an absolutely connection on the money. Like you're not putting the ball over from 100 yards. Whereas lads would be doing it routinely uh, in the summertime. And I'm only thinking of Blanchfield's point at the end of all Ireland last year. That ball probably would have landed in around the 21 or in around the D, I'd say, yesterday. It's just the, the way it was. But I prefer him, I have to say, I prefer David Blanchfield at wing back. And I've said it before. And I think him and Derek Corkin potentially will be the two wing backs, two big imposing wing backs. If you're looking at matching up matching up against the Limerick half uh, forward line, you're thinking physically these two lads might be able to do that. Killian Buckley back at six was an interesting one as well. Not sure if I see that long term realistically. Um, very good positioning and that, but no, I, I just don't really see that long term. And Derek Ling actually commented as well after about, about Richie Hogan, uh, Walter Walsh, Connor Fogarty and Killian Buckley being back. And he says they're all raring to go and we'll probably see a bit more of them as, that, as the months go on. Yeah, I would have said that size-wise and athleticism-wise that Kilkenny looked that bit bigger and more filled out than Offaly. Now, obviously, Offaly are coming from a lower base and all that kind of stuff. But even players that are new enough, like Des Dunn is a pig of a man. Peter MacDonald is also... A lot of these younger guys, they look like in serious physical shape. So there's a bit of a gap still to be bridged for Offaly. Now, one big positive... Now, saying that, Shane, there's a big gap to be bridged from Kilkenny to the likes of the bigger hitter, the real big hitters in Limerick as well, like, and Derek Lincoln yeah. kind of acknowledged that after. So it's amazing. There's almost like tears of physicality, of tears of conditioning, if you get me as well. And we're, yeah, true. we're, we're striving, Kilkenny are striving get to the limericks of this world and that's probably that'll be one of the biggest kind of hurdles that a lot of those young players are going to have to overcome over the next couple of years yeah one final point then i'd make an awfully jason sampson was in the forward line last year geez i yeah. thought he was excellent at center back especially when he was sitting in front of the full back line he's such a tidy hurler he's getting on the ball constantly yeah uh, i was surprised at this one um because most people would have seen Killian Kylie at 11 and Samson at 6 and thinking like the natural thing is probably to, to nearly switch the two of these. Uh, I've never seen Jason play, play anywhere outside of 8 upwards before, apart from when he used to play in goals. He played in goals for Colossus the Pubble Ross Gray, I think, when they won in All-Ireland. Oh, Jesus, many, many moons ago. Kieran's beat Arts Gold Reach the same day in an All-Ireland club fight, uh, an All-Ireland Colleges final. But I'd never seen him play anywhere outside of the forwards or midfield since then. I think uh, what what was best about him was his positioning. He seemed to always be in the right place um, and he got on a decent bit of ball. Don't know if he struck the ball the whole game, actually, to be honest with you, but got on a lot of ball, hand-passed it away. Um, and again, talking about experimentation, be interesting to see. He was he got uh, presented with the Offaly Club Player of the Year uh, the other night. That would have been for his work in the forward line with Shinron and as captain with Shinron. So be interesting to see if that's um, if that's something they go with long term or it's just a matter of we were missing Ben Keneally. We needed a presence at six uh, and maybe the, he could go back up to the forward line. But it'll be interesting to see. 
God, if I was uh, an awfully person, I wouldn't mind seeing him stay there. If you if you feel you've enough forwards, like if Oshin Kelly can get back up to speed, and if uh, Keelan Kylie can also hit the ground running for the rest of the year, he's a, that would be an unbelievable spine to the team. Uh, Dublin beat Antrim three twenty six to two twenty two. I was in at this game, and uh, the closing stages. Dublin pulled away. Now, they'd been ahead several times through the game. I think they went six or seven points up during the first half. Midway through the second half, they were that ahead as well. And in the final 10 minutes after Antrim had brought it back level, Dublin went on a run of one six to two points. AJ Murphy came on and he scored a goal. But it's more what Michal Donoghue is doing. So this is obviously his first game. From his point of view, nice to get a win on the board because there's probably not far off 10 players from last year who aren't there anymore. Just to name a few of them, like Liam Rush, you're talking about uh, Keno Callahan, uh, Chris Crummy, Mark Schutte. There's, um, I think, Dunica Ryan is gone. There's, there's an awful lot of players. There's several more. So it's a very new look team when you when you compare it with uh, with previous years. So Chris O'Leary, he played uh, full uh, centre back, and I see Pure Hatchet asking Shane, what did you make of Chris O'Leary at six for uh, Dublin? He was a very good player below in Cork, but could never nail down a spot on the Cork team. Very good physical player. So he's like size wise. He almost looks like Liam Rush, who, of course, is gone now uh, to Australia. Um, how did he play there? Probably relatively quiet. Like I think he's a brilliant ball striker, very good hurler. And it was in the second half when he seemed to move out around midfield and Daryl Gray moved from being a sweeper, a very deep line sweeper, out to centre-back and absolutely lorded it. I thought that Chris O'Leary started to come into the game there. So he'll, he'll definitely have a role to play for Dublin this year. I can imagine he'd be a starter. Some of the other lads who really stood out for me, uh, Killian Costello. He was actually on the panel under Pat Gilroy, what, 2018 that was at this stage? But he had a brilliant run with Nave Barogue this year. You might remember that they lost the Leinster Intermediate Hurling semi-final against Bray Emmett. He was suspended that game, and I think somewhat something to do with whatever happened against Owlert uh, the previous day out. He was really good. Reminds me a little bit of Jamie Barron. I mean, that's a slight exaggeration, but he's got uh, he's got shades of that. And then Joe Flanagan played at centre forward. Really excellent player. Scored two points from play. Scored eight frees and three sixty fives as well. So he was very good. Uh, Lee Murphy, obviously a club mate of mine in Kula, he scored one uh, a goal from play. Brilliant finish at the start of the second half. Also set up a goal for Glenn Whelan in the first half. Keen Boland is back after injury as well. So lots of positives there for Dublin. No, plenty for Antrim as well. Um, definitely looks like, would it be fair to say that Michal Dunne, who has scoured the clubs and tried to pick up as many lads as possible from maybe some left field places as well. Well, like put it this way, before, like if you're to go based on 2022 championship tiers in Dublin, six out of the 15 didn't play in the top level in Dublin. Now, you know, one of the, seven, a couple of the players are on a team that got promoted. But that kind of says something that you've got that many players that weren't playing at the top tier. And I believe, you know, bringing in Joe Flanagan, that was a case of uh, Donna who might have gone to watch Killian Costello. And, you know, all of a sudden Joe Flanagan came on his radar because they both play for Nate Barogue. So he's found a couple of players there. And in the latter stages, he brought some experience off the bench. So James Madden, uh, Connor Burke. Andrew AJ Murphy, he's not that experienced, but he's a good player. Brought on Endo, O'Donnell, Paul Crummy, and Alex Considine. So he was able to bring a nice bit of power um, off the bench. Whereas I think Antrim started with a more experienced, like a, a team that has more experience playing at the top level and maybe didn't bring on quite the same level of uh, experience. But to be fair, they were operating without the Dunloy lads. So Ryan Elliott, Keelan Malloy, Shan Elliott, Conal Cunning, and also Kieran Clark, Connor McCann, and Connor Johnson weren't there. And they still produced plenty of good stuff. Like Niall McKenna scored 1-2 from wing forward. His goal was a brilliant finish. Michael Bradley, who we'd regularly see centre forward or midfield, he scored three points from wing back. And Rian McMullen, who's a new player, he was in a corner forward. He scored 1-1. And James McNaughton, as ever, was very good. He scored uh, three points from play. Outside of Alex Considine, many Crocs players involved? Or was he the only one? Not involved? one. Not one. So you probably will see um, Dara Purcell and pr possibly Davy Crow and obviously uh, Ronan Hayes and Fergal Whiteley. Uh, you you'll probably see all of them involved pretty soon. Okay, yeah, yeah. like it, like looking at looking at Crokes particularly well the day against Mullins and the day against Bally Hale. I'd imagine a lot of those guys would fit into the style of player that that Michal Dunu is is looking for. Um, definitely, if the, the particularly the latter years with Galway would suggest anyway. And it's interesting to hear Dunu talking after as well about taking on the Dublin job and how he kind of realised that you know it was nearly now or never if he was another couple of years out of 
inter county is not there's no opening in Galway, um, nor does it look like there's gonna be for a while. Uh, and I don't know what his relations are with the with the Galway County Board because that was one of the reasons he left. But that's kind of a common enough kind of team. Owen Kelly said something similar to me when I was chatting him before Christmas. He's obviously involved with, with Waterford now. Like if you're out of the game four to five years and you haven't been like Dunhu would have had his finger on the pulse with the Sunday game and watching games and stuff like that. But it's a total different kettle of fish when you're down on the line and you see different things that are happening in the matches that wouldn't have just just wouldn't have happened four or five years ago. Wouldn't have happened when Galway won the All Ireland. Uh, mm. And even th- things you're seeing approaches, uh, tactical stuff, S and C stuff that has just moved on another level from when he was there before. So it's kind of I think um, I think John Costello gave him the call at just the right time. I'd say. Yeah, um, just a couple of other young players who did well. I thought um, I thought Eddie Moran was did all right. Uh, did well actually. I thought Dara Power did well. I thought Derek McBride, St. Vincent's player, very fast, mobile, good hurler playing at wing back, and also the way Dublin played an awful lot of crossfield ball into the pockets for those nippy enough inside forwards. Like Glenn Whelan's a big target man. He did uh, quite well. But Liam Murphy and Keno Sullivan were getting out in front for the nice crossfield balls. But actually, Antrim adjusted and sat back that bit more. And like I was saying earlier in the show, at times Antrim had only two men in the opposition half, but Dublin were also the same. So they were sort of um, they were sort of matching each other up that sort of way. So a good win there for Dublin. Not the end of the world for Antrim, of course, under Darren Gleeson. Yeah, encouraging enough because they can not been smarter, Jed. Like they're missing five to six starters from from Dunlai, who obviously have. Uh, bigger fish to fry in a couple of weeks, but it's a good sign that they've got depth where they can go down to play. You know, a real, you know, obviously Antrim are top tier this year as well, but they're only coming up. But it's good to see how competitive they were, the score that they were able to put up, considering the, the class of personnel that they're missing. Mm, yeah, okay, we'll move on to the next one. So, Leash beat Wexford 20 points to 18. It's actually the first competitive fixture uh, at in Mount Rat since 1982. Right, yeah. which is quite something um so from from what i've seen i saw about the first 20 minutes and i read up a little bit more so great defensive efforts from ender roland fieker c fennel and donica hartnett uh mossy Key, mossy keys excellent up front uh james duggan he he made his debut in the inside forward line for leash as well he was quite good knocked over a couple of frees and a couple from play Paddy Purcell, new position at number six there now we've seen him play kind of sweeper before and in that so it's not entirely new for him but um, good win for Willie Maher in his first competitive match in charge and given the, the locals something to shout about because uh, they probably haven't tasted victory over Wexford in any competition that many times recently. Well, I tell you, nothing jumps out to the top of my head anyway. Uh, no. At the moment, I can't. I couldn't, well, a few uh, hammerings that they took in Leinster in recent times stand out. Yeah, the, the parcel one at six is interesting. Um, he's obviously getting a bit older now. His greatest asset would have been his ability to break the line and carry ball. Maybe they're looking at must be 30-ish or just the far side of that 30, now. Yeah. yeah, so maybe they're looking at, um, I don't know, it's quite funny when you get older, you use your head a lot more than your body maybe because your body can't take you where you'd want to go. So that they might look at him at six. Um, Podge, I don't think Podge Delaney was playing, was he? Because he's one of their, he's he's another player that you could potentially build, build the team around at, at six or even playing at wing back as well. Um, there was a lot of new faces. Ross King only came only came in. Obviously, it's good. I think it's it's fairly heartening from a leash point of view that they would hit the ground running like this. And uh, obviously, Lee Chin uh, only came in for Wexford. There was no uh, there was no Rory O'Connor. I don't think there was any Connor McDonald either. But you can only beat what's what's about in front of you. So definitely a good start. Um, and like Leash are, this is going to be one of the uh, they're go- Leash are in that unusual position this year where. They're playing all Division One league, and then they drop back almost to play Joe McDonough. And like, really, the only thing that would be accepted from the niche public, I'd imagine, would be coming straight back up. Um, so these sort of games against you know good quality opposition are you know they're worth their weight in gold for them. So it's massive to get a result. Mm, and I was I was pleased for James Duggan that he was popping over his freeze and he got a couple of points from play because he was on our UCD Freshers team last year and uh, nice fella so delighted to see him going well. A uh, great save from uh, Ender Rowland late on. I think Chin had rose high to collect the ball late on and he found Josh Shields in space. But uh, a great save from Rowland off him. Um, Kyle Furman actually I saw him playing in the uh, corner forward for Wexford. Thought he was quite good. So there's, there's a couple of players that probably stuck the head above the parapet for both sides there. Just Galway had a pretty easy win over, a convincing win over Westmead. 
Yeah, I think it was competitive enough in the first half from what I'm reading, but they definitely put the foot to the floor in the second half. So it finished Galway 3.27, Westmead 20 points. So Henry Shefflin said he was pleased enough with how his experimental side uh, got on top in the second half. Just a couple of quotes from him. Um, he said it was kind of a battle between the two free takers, Evan Nyland and Killian Doyle. I think Evan Nyland ended up with 17 points, while Killian Doyle had a dozen for Westmead. Killian Doyle was obviously Westmead's first uh, All-Star nomination in, I think it's a good about 35 or 36 years last year. Uh, but Shefflin just said on the game, this competition is about giving players an opportunity. And I think we very much ticked that box. It was great to see some of the younger players perform so well. And I think the lads put in a big shift. First half wasn't pretty and we were fortunate to go in ahead, but I thought we were better in the second half. We opened up a bit more. We had Garod McInerney at fullback and Connor Whelan at centre forward. And they were two players from our championship team from last year. So it's important to have those players in the central positions because there are so many new players who probably don't know each other that well. And it's important to have that bit of experience and leadership around the place. So overall, we're happy with this first outing and we'll go from there. Just fly through the scores really quickly. Evan Nyland, 17 points. Some score to be putting up. Uh, 16 of them from place balls, 14 pre frees, 265s. Uh, good to see Don Lachey contributing as well. He ended up with 2-3. Martin McManus, obviously from Loch Ray, uh, he's kept that goal scoring touch. He ended up with 2-1. With uh, Sean Lalan a point. John Cooney a point. Adrian Tui, uh, who we that probably flew under the radar that he was one of the players that was initially let go. By Shefflin when he came in, and I actually hadn't realised it until until I read it just there. So good to see him back. He was obviously uh, an All Ireland winner uh, in 2017 at mm. cornerback. He was and playing, yeah, he was playing wing back yesterday. One, two, three, four, five. He's actually playing centre back yesterday. PJ Brennan was outside him as well. Just some of the other names that came in: Tiernan Killeen, obviously Lock Ray too. He came in. Mark Kendy got a goal. Sean O'Hanlon and Kevin Hanny um, from a West Mead point of view. Obviously, struggled for scores outside of Killian Doyle. He got a dozen, uh, 11 of those from place balls. Uh, Niall Mitchell was back inside from his exploits with the football with the downs. He was kept relatively quiet. Um, no sign of Niall O'Brien. So they obviously gave a few. Uh, Niall O'Brien actually was playing. He's playing out the pitch, actually. He's playing half forward. He finished with two points as well. But um, yeah, from a from a Gala point of view, definitely encouraging. Don Lachey, as I remember someone I watched a bit watched him in the Fitzgibbon last year. Uh obviously Eamon's Eamon's son. Um there's plenty of ability and there. His brother is the manager of U C D as well, which that that probably hasn't happened too many places uh, in Ireland, his brother Don over the team. Very Sorry, good, Connor. Yeah. Over the yeah, definitely not something that happens too often. And just while we're on that as well, it was a, a really good weekend for Galway all around. The Galway development squad beat Rock. Sorry, Common. just before you go on, yeah. you go on. I, I think by mistake you said Don Loche scored two three. He scored three points, and Martin McManus, who had a great season with Lock Ray, scored two one. But yeah, jump on. Yeah, no, just obviously a real good weekend for Galway as well with the development squad winning that Connacht Senior Hurling League final. They beat Ross Common one twenty five to one nineteen. Uh, that's an all, uh, they're all hailing from junior clubs, that Galway development squad, managed by Eamon O'Shea, obviously Donald's, uh, Donald's father, I think coached by Tommy Dunn as well. Uh, so a great win for them. I'd have to say from a Ross Common point of view, uh, after putting up such a big score as they did against Leitrim, it's disappointing for a county team to come up short against a development squad that's probably only trained five or six times and is made up solely of junior players, the vast majority of which are young up and coming players but yeah you know, it's a county team you know that i don't know how team. strong their team would have been either and like there's one of the the ucd fresher guys is on that galway development panel and I, as far as i know he didn't see game time in this match he certainly didn't in the previous one against new york and he's a decent player so if he's not getting any game time whatsoever i'd imagine that there's plenty of good talent there but like you know yourself sometimes players are with junior clubs and maybe the snc etc level of competition and all that it's not going to afford that player the the opportunity to kick on to the next level. So there could be plenty of talent there, and it's just trying to, you know, bring him on up to the next level. So maybe it's a little bit harsh on Roscommon. Ah, I'm just saying it's a county, it's a county team coming up against yeah. a squad that was kind of thrown together. What's interesting from my point of view would be what happens at development squad now. Is that going to continue on? Will they be put on? You know, will they be put on a, a strength and conditioning program? By Lucas Kurzenstein and hopefully a lot of them brought through the ranks over the next couple of years. That'll be very, very interesting to see. Okay, so uh, Stephen Lofsa says, Don Loche looks sharp for Galway. 17 points for Nyland. Lots of debuts with John Cooney, Martin McManus and Declan McLaughlin in the forwards. 
Uh, Jack Nolte says uh, Westmead made a lot of changes in the second half. Is Evan Nyland a championship player or someone that throws over 17 or 18 points in an occasional league game? We'll find out more as the year goes on. Martin Furlong, Wexford had nine debutants starting against Leash. Richie Lawler, Ross Bandle and Kyle Furman were very good. I think uh, Bandle was on the freeze also. Uh, next game to talk about then, Kyo Cup, Carlo beat Wicklow, 4.26 to 1.8 there, so... They ate them without salt, really, in Dr. Cullen Park. And Meath beat down 224 to 116. That was in the Dungani Centre of Excellence. Now, you want to run a bit of a quiz time here for our viewers. So, viewers, get involved and be ready to answer good and quick. Yeah, just a, just a really quick little quiz. Uh, we got a nice bit, of, nice bit of success out of it during the week, and everyone enjoyed the one before Christmas. So it might be something that we do a bit more. So I don't want the answer sent in individually. I'm going to ask three questions, and you must have the three answers sent in so you can comment in but if, if you don't have all three answers unless you're thrown in now i don't even want an a and other we want all three answers in there yeah. no dinella or a and other you know i saw it in a program you'll be disqualified <laughs> yeah you'll be disqualified i saw it in a, in a program during the week I hadn't seen it in a long time so this is the first of three i'll wrap them off fairly quickly here so first question what club does kilkenny senior hurling manager Derek ling hail from so what club is Derek ling from Question number two, who took over from Eamon Murray as Mead Ladies Football Manager? Um, That's a handy you should, one. You should, you should know. They're the, they're the back-to-back All-Ireland champions and going for three in a row, and they have a new manager. The last question is this. Of the managers in Division 1 of the Hurling lead, League, which club has the unique honour of having two managers from the same club? So of the 12 teams that are in Division 1 of the Hurling League, there is one club that is represented uh, in, by managers, basically two managers within those 12 teams. Can you name the club and obviously what county as well? So really quickly, what club is Derek Ling? What club does he hail from? Number two, who took over from Aim Murray as Mead Ladies Football Manager? And what club has two managers um, managing in Division 1 of the Hurling League this year? So we'll fly yeah. on. Yeah, well, we have a winner in straight away. Well, let's see if someone else brings in a few answers as well. By the way, you know the way you said, what club does he hail from? I was yeah. once going to have, I, I think I might have actually had it as my Twitter bio, hail from Burris the Lee, shine for Kula. Well, obviously, that's complete nonsense. Awful. But, uh, Jesus. <laughs> hey, come on. Come on. <laughs> uh, so, Jay Quan is first in. Are we going to allow Erlingford? I mean, obviously, we know he's right. But Erlingford, Davy Nelson, Ballangarry, if you want it to be really pernickety, Fergus Butler says A, Emeralds, B, Davy Nelson, C, Ballangarry, County Tip, because Willie Maher and, and Liam Cal. Very impressive, I have to say. Yeah, they, to be fair, I'll allow Erlingford because it would often be said Emeralds of Erlingford or Erlingford. Uh, yeah, it would, I, I, I'll, give, I'll give them that. They were fairly sharp on the buzzer in fairness to them. Yeah, Mr. Quan, you're on top. Well played there. Uh, your prize is with no prize. <laughs> honor and pride yeah okay we're going to talk a bit of football now and michael verney's going to take over the tweet while he's at that um the all ireland football semi-finals kilmacud beat cairns or 114 to 14 and the other side glenn beat boy cullen of galway that's 111 to 12 points and the thing that stood out in both of these matches is there was many collapses from the two teams that seemed very much large and in charge like both teams struggled to sort of manage the game and like at the end of it, you know, Crokes were, you know, the goalkeeper, obviously, he held on, Connor Ferris held on to a ball at one stage and he was soloing it on the spot and on the spot and on the spot. And then all of a sudden he ran out of options. Now, he might have had one player who was under pressure to his left looking for a hand pass, but that might have gone wrong. So he ended up booting it out the field and Cairns O'Reilly were, you know, straight away they profited from it. And then there was a late free that was pumped into the area. You knew it was sort of last chance saloon. David Moran got a punch over Ferris and it was just was I'm not entirely sure who caught the ball on the line it might have been one of the substitutes possibly Luke Ward or Park Purcell so you had that in the first game and then in the second game I, I don't know how quite how my Colin Cullen got back into it but they had um now this is where I'd say that the black card yet again came up short so I think oh, it was yeah. Peter Cook who was who was driving through or was it Desi Keneally I, I can't remember off the top of my head but they were dragged to the ground and yeah, black card, great. I think it was Emmett Bradley who was black carded. But once again, the black card tackle was rewarded because they didn't, have, it should be a penalty. Anywhere on the field, I think black card foul has to be a penalty. And people say, oh yeah, so if it's 100 yards from goal, are you going to give a cynical foul as a penalty? 
Yes, because it will never happen. It will never, ever happen. And the only time it will happen is if somebody is trying to stop a quick counter, which is basically trying to stop a goal. So again, I just, but even can at I, that can stage. Can I just ask you, um, the ruling in basketball, is, is, that foul, is it a foul anywhere in the court? Is a free throw the same as well? Is that the same? Yeah, so there's different types of fouls. There's like team fouls and personal fouls. Um, I think pretty pretty sure that it is kind of any sort of intentional type foul is is free throws. I think somebody might be able to correct us there, for, um, for sure. It but just um, because it punish it again, that would punish on the scoreboard. So you, you think you think you're taking one for the team, and we heard Lee Keegan say earlier there from five or six years ago that people would gladly take one for the team if that's all it is. That's only a personal thing. I, like I'm suffering by getting a black card. The team's not really suffering, particularly if it's at the very end. Whereas the team is suffering if it's on the scoreboard, or there's a great chance for it to be on the scoreboard. If the penalty's not scored, the penalty's not scored. Yeah, like Emmett Bradley goes off for like a minute, and basically his team end up winning because the cynical foul worked. So it just shows the black card doesn't go far enough. But even at that, Desi Keneally went short to Peter Cook, and Cook didn't quite hold on to it. And do you know what? Then he had the shot, and the full time whistle went. But I kind of thought, was that a foot block from one of the Glen defenders? And I saw the hands go out from David Goff. And I thought, and I was saying it to the journalist beside me, I think he's given a penalty. And obviously, there was only two points in it at that stage. I thought it was huge drama. And then I saw the Glen players celebrating, and I realized, OK, it's just a full-time whistle. But there was just that moment of confusion yeah. there. David Moore, what a performance, by the way. Uh, Jack Nulty is saying it there, class, be an as asset for Kerry for one more year. But have Again, you seen I, yeah, I was down in Callan, so I only got to see some of the highlights after. Um, but it's just like, four years of age and still playing like that. It's the classic case of you know a midfielder absolutely lording it, just like owning the game, uh, lord of the skies. Um, it's ama it's amazing, really. Um, and it's funny. I don't know if his decision was made up already about whether he's going back with Kerry or whether he's not going back with Kerry. But when you prefer, if just say he had decided that you know he's going to finish up with Kerry. If you perform like that in Crow Park, surely it just causes a U-turn. And I'm only being hypothetical here. I don't know if a decision has been made or whether he is whether he was coming back regardless. But when you perform to that level against a club side of the quality of Kilmacud Crokes, you'd imagine he has a bit more to offer. And I, listen, I'd be surprised if he's not back from the point of view as well of he would have been disappointed himself with the All-Ireland final and coming off at halftime. And I'd say Paul Ganey's the exact same as well. And I think they'd both be gung-ho to, to make amends this year. But have to give credit to David Moore, number one. Have to give credit to Karen Zorales overall, number two. I, I thought this would be at arm's length the whole way. And it wasn't. And Crokes were kind of holding on at the end. So massive credit to, to Karen Zorales, who like some of their own would have even been very fearful going up to Crow Park of what awaited them. But they, they produced a, a massive performance. Kick 14 points. That's the most... Um, Nace kicked 14, I think, against Kilmacud as well. But that's the highest score they've conceded since then. And I think even during the, the Dublin Championship, they didn't concede the colour of 14 points. I think Kula got 1-9, was one of the highest tallies put up against them. Um, and on the flip of that, we've been saying Kilmacud haven't been scoring that much. The 1-14 they hit yesterday, outside of the 3-14 against Nace, is the highest they've hit, I think, since they beat Temple Oak Sing Street in the group stages. Yeah, and even better still for Karen Ker Zorali is that like some of their half back line at the time looked at like they were gassed out of it and they still found a way back into the game. Um, Tommy Walsh, he had a bit of joy early in the game, but didn't really happen for him. Theo Clancy had a good game on him. Cormac Coffey was unbelievable on Shane Walsh. Now, a little bit unlucky for, or sorry, um, Shane Walsh was a little bit unlucky once or twice, but um, generally very good. He had a brilliant pointed attempt that came down off the crossbar slash Shane Foley trying to take it down. And uh, Hugh Kenny, who ended up with man in the match, won two. He put it into the back of the net. In the first half, five out of the six forwards had scored from play for Kilmacud Croaks. Shane Walsh being the only one who hadn't. Um, so a great win for them. What odds would you got on that? Genie, Mac, yeah. what odds would you got like, on that? <laughs> they're just getting over the line as well. And sometimes you look at this and wonder, will they eventually be caught? But um, I think I it's going to be good the other way, Shane. I think, um, I think there's a huge performance brewing for the final. I and maybe Paul Mannion will be able to play a part. I think he only did a brief part of the warm up. Maybe it's too soon for him. But um, just with the Glen, I thought like they had a lot of wides in the first half. Well, in the game, but when they did score, they they just were cracking points. Ethan Darty hit a few beauties. So did Danny Tallon. Emmett Bradley's points. Geez, they were fantastic as well. And Tiernan Flanagan, he scored a very good goal. I thought Michael Warnock 
uh, at number six. I thought he was brilliant. So composed coming out with the ball throughout the game. Uh, Peter Cook, a couple of brilliant points as well. But there was too few play players contributing on the scoreboard for my Cullen. Niall Walsh was the only starting forward to score from play for the majority of the game until um, until Owen Gallagher did late on. But my Cullen, when, uh, when they were going forward at times, I was like, this is like a they don't seem to be as tactically evolved in terms of how they're bringing the ball forward and the way their forwards are kind of spreading out on the pitch and then moving over and back and trying to drive through uh, space and gaps in the defence, whereas I thought that Glenn did do that a little bit better. Obviously, there was very little in between between the teams for a finish, but um, I just think that Glenn against Crokes is probably the better matchup for the All-Ireland Final. I hope my Cullen people aren't upset with me for saying that, but hey, Robbie Brennan, his screensaver. It's great stuff, isn't it? I, I, I was amazed by this. It's, so it's something that um, you probably wouldn't, I generally wouldn't put out if I was a manager or a player. Like the Colin Fenley thing with Barry Coughlin, I wouldn't have put that out until after the game um, that, they were, that he was cheesed off the speech. But Robbie Brennan said yesterday that his, the screensaver on his phone is the Kilku lads lifting the trophy last year. So um, and I was only thinking about it, like what other, um, you know, that's a, obviously a motivation tactic. And if you're ever feeling down in the mouth or anything like that, you'd barely be perked up when you see that. But like what other teams have used things like that to spur them on? The classic ones is always the, you know, we were written off in the paper or someone said this or someone said that. Yeah. Actually, the, the Eamon Cregan one about where did this performance come from? The media! Um, <laughs> but um, I'd be, it'd be interesting to hear what other kind of things people have used as motivation. Like, motivate with something like that, motivation quickly becomes like, when you actually step across the white lines, if a player had something like that on their phone, like, it does become hatred, like, you would you like you literally would be boiling, and the whole previous year comes out in making a, you know really busting a gut when you really really have to really thinking about uh, what we felt this time last year here the pain that we went through. Uh, donkeys don't win derbies. Yeah, that was a great one. Like that was like that was Babs giving the opposition motivation. It was absolutely bonkers, really. Um, and again. Bab's given motivation to be awfully lads when he when he was about to step aside when he said they were like sheep in a heap as well. But and apparently he had a couple of quid on Offaly to win the All Ireland when he was gotten rid of that year as well. So maybe he was trying to motivate them. But it's amazing what people will use to get a little edge or just to motivate you, particularly during the the real dark, dreary winter nights when you're going through that slough. Yeah, ML89 says the Desi Keneally miss free in front of the post to bring it back to a point with seven to eight minutes left was huge. Big swing with Glenn getting a score straight away then. I call and have huge regrets. To be fair, it was pretty far out free. It was probably the edge of the D more or less. It was a tough free under under an awful lot of pressure at the time. So I don't want to be too harsh on him. A reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code RGAME and you get 15% off. The jerseys are absolutely sweet. As you can see here, these uh, couple of Mayo ones, which were kind of wear as a salute to Lee Keegan, who's retired. Uh, the Galway Fancy Dan's in 1998. Yeah, that's a good one. Nicky English spine right there in 1998. Can you, can you refresh my memory about the Fancy Dan's? I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was definitely something said in the media. Remember when we were talking to Kevin Walsh and um, and John O'Mahony? It was definitely mentioned there. Somebody might comment in and let us know. Nicky English spine right there in 1993. Now, that was the most exaggerated thing of all time. Shane, do you not realise that you're not allowed to smile when you win? <laughs> you have to be dour about everything. Yeah, no, yeah, people, it's funny. People will, will take, coming yeah. down here. Huh? Yeah, well, people will take anything. Like, um, like when you're, you've been in the position, I've been in the position. When you're particularly standing on the pitch with when there's a speech coming down, or you see someone from the opposition that have won, doesn't even have to be player. We all listen. There's all different people from different clubs that they don't maybe haven't poked the ball in ten years, but we just don't like them for whatever reason. Maybe they're loud in the crowd. I don't know. There's something about them. They signify a lot of what we dislike about a club. And maybe you see them jumping around after a, you know a final whistle goes and you lose or something like that. Or even I've often been like say when we we're in county finals before and you're coming out of the other semi final and you just see something and you see someone and you're just like ah. I'm gonna sicken them in two weeks' time, or you know, you know the way it is. That's the way. That's the way. That's the way it works. We'll take anything we can get. And uh, Robbie Brennan was fairly frustrated with the free count, thirty to eight against them. And in terms of free score, it was six points to one against. Uh, well, for Karen's O'Reilly. So um, 
Yeah, that would definitely be a little bit frustrating. Uh, the McGrath Cup, Tipperary beat Waterford 214 to 17 points. And like, as we were saying at the top of the show, without Colin O'Reardon and uh, Michael Quinvan to call on, obviously a great boost for David Power to get a victory in that game, the McGrath Cup. But Waterford are certainly struggling for players this year. I think a lot of players that they'd hoped to get involved uh, won't be making themselves available. Just on that, Shane, Quinlevin not been involved and Colin O'Reardon, you know, it looks like his future is probably elsewhere. Like, listen, I'm not sure what Colin would have been able to do anyway with the way his hips are, like what level he would have been able to play to. Um, but I suppose the last time he was in training with Tip, they ended up winning the Munster. Um, and that obviously, Quinlevin opted out that year and ended up back because of, because of COVID. Um, but Quinlevin not been there. Like, Quinlevin is one of the best footballers Tip have produced. And it does suck a bit of life out of their, you know, aspirations for the year. Not saying that he might definitely not be involved because the door is definitely left open from David Power's point of view. But you'd have to say if he's probably not involved now, it's probably, you know, less likely that he's going to be involved, shall we say. Yeah, he's turning 30 in a month or so. So, you know, you're talking about him at, at his peak now. Uh, Kerry beat Clare by 14 points to 13. Having conceded five goals against Cork, no harm to get a victory here. Uh, Tony Brosnan scored six. They had a very slow start to this game. I think they were four points to nil down, uh, steady down the likes of Michal Burns getting on the score sheet. Uh, Ronan Buckley, Tom O'Sullivan, Dara Roach all getting on the score sheet here as well. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world one way or the other, whether they won or lost this game, but no harm to get a win on the board. Uh, the, the word that I took from this was that Kerry undeservedly grabbed a win. So, Claire were obviously... The better team for for much of the game. Um, they're obviously without David Tuberty now, who's retired. The the highest score in the history of the league, and they still have plenty of good talent there. You'd have to say the likes of Keelan Sexton, uh, Jamie Malone, Carl O'Connor, etc. Um, and it's going to be fascinating with Tuberty gone now. How would Clare fare in Division Two? We probably always think that they're going to be down the bottom end of Division Two, and they manage to be up near the top end every year. Um. Clare football, you would have to say, is one of the, the great success stories probably of the last, definitely since 2014 onwards, really since Colin Collins took over, how consistent uh, they have been uh, throughout that spell. And it's going to be interesting to see if they can maintain that. In what is a real shark tank of, division, of a Division 2, I think if you look at it, Limerick and Loud, the two teams that came up, you probably on paper would say that they're the two most likeliest to go down, but I'd say one of them will probably stay up on, who is it, Dublin, Derry, Kildare, Mead, you know, it's a crack in Division 2. Yeah, the majority of Irish players that go to Oz end up cracked with injuries. It must be awful severe in the body, especially when there are some when these are some of the top athletes at home. It's a good point. Uh, Loud are opting out of the O'Byrne Cup uh, game against Wexford on Wednesday. Midweek fixture, obviously. Number of players involved in the Sigerson uh, exams as well as work commitments. So they won't take part. Wexford will get that walkover. And after, after doing, well, beating Kildare, um, at the weekend as well. It's probably disappointing that Mickey Hart can't uh, get another fixture under the belt. Yeah, they must have been severely ha hamstrung here. Um, I, know, I know that the, kind of the demographic within the squad would be young enough. They would have a good few players pulled from them. I don't know, it's, it's a really awkward one. You're playing, what did they play? Everyone would have played last, um, was it last Wednesday? Uh, this weekend and then next Wednesday again like it's three games within seven days the hurling would say in Leinster is Walsh Cup is three games in three weeks like that's manageable enough but three games in seven days when you don't have that big of a squad maybe and there's a lot of players cup tied with Sigerson like there's a lot of traffic going through a lot of college legs at the moment lads playing Sigerson and Fitzgibbon such a difficult balancing act um, as we yeah, found out with Tommy Conroy last year yeah, exactly. Um, so it's, a, it's a really difficult kind of juggling act. But, you know, I just would you'd implore uh, county managers to see the bigger picture. Like, if I ever evolved at county level, I'm not saying I ever will be, but surely you would see the benefit of a guy playing Fitzgibbon Cup or a guy playing Sigerson. And, like, I'll never forget, um, and he, well, I, don't know, I don't know if you'll mind me saying it or not, but I'll never forget with Joe Dooley. I remember training with UL at 6 o'clock on a Friday, and then four of us jumped in a car and drove back to Tullamore to train with Offaly later that evening. It was madness. It was absolute madness. And we landed in, landed in with the UL gear on. We'd all blue jackets on. 
and I think Joel made us do a lap for being late or something, <laughs> something like that. Um, the times have changed a good bit since then. I think that was 2010 or 2011. But the ben- to me, the benefits of a guy, you know, giving more of his time to Fitzgibbon or Sigerson at this time of the year um, and, you know, you know, juking out with guys of his own age of a really good calibre and the amount of uh, information that they would soak in from being involved in that you know, UCD squad or an NUIG squad or UL squad or whatever it is. I think that totally outweighs, you know, oh, you, you have to play this county game now. Or, you know, we won't have you on the panel for the year. I think managers need to see the bigger picture in that and not to be flogging lads or not risking lads, um, not risking lads' fitness for, you know, the next couple of months over playing this game or making this training session. Yeah, and for Lowe to win that game after him four points to nil behind is a very good show in there. Westmead beat Wexford 116 to 6. So Desi Dolan's got to be pretty pleased with that, his Talton Cup winning team. Uh, Longford beat Carlo 15 points to four. If I remember correctly, Longford put up a, a nice little score on Leash last week and put a few goals on the board. 15 points to four over Carlo's good going as well. So um, you'd imagine that Paddy Christie in his first year is, is very happy with the way things are going. Yeah, two wins from two. Um, not been smart. Like, you know, Longford have won, you know, have won a decent amount of games, but winning two from two. I couldn't tell you the last time they won two from two, and maybe that's just my ignorance. But uh, it's important to hit. I think it is important to hit the ground running there. I see uh, Mickey Quinn has stayed involved. There's definitely one of the McGivneys involved from Mullinyakta. They've been, you know, the Mullinyakta representation at county level hadn't been particularly big. So hopefully he's gotten, you know, most of the best players back involved. I actually ventured over to uh, ventured over to Park Talchin, um last Saturday for a look at. Leash and Leash and Mead. I jumped into my car about twenty eight minutes past one, and it was telling me it was going to get to Parnell Park at seven minutes past two. So I said I'm not going to miss the starters. So I went to Park Talton for a look. It was absolutely miserably cold. Oh my god! I moved I moved seats about six times just to keep just to keep warm at different stages. Um, and it just goes to show you any sort of a game where it's tight can be interesting. Um. Leash, Leash actually did well um, did well against the Breeze in the first half. We're level at half time. Um, Mead had a good few, missed an awful lot of chances in the first half, dropped an awful lot of ball short, particularly into the into the keeper's hand. Must have happened five or six times. But it looked like um, it looked like Mead were going to pull away midway through the second half. Leash came back. Evan O'Carroll was brilliant on the place balls, really, really good in the place balls, real on her in accuracy. And uh, he, I think it was his point uh, I think he kicked seven points in total, but that helped to to push uh to push it through for a draw, and it was a big result for Leash because, as you said, they've been beating out the gate the week before. Uh, Billy Sheehan as Leash manager, definitely one of the most animated managers in the intercounty game. I'd say he would give Rory Gallagher uh, a run for his money. The amount of uh, energy he uses and how much his how much his mouth is open on the line, um, all real all action stuff. Colin O'Rourke, I went down and just studied him for the second half of the game. And you know when a team is inside the, the other team's 45 slash 65 and you end up just kind of going laterally and passing the ball around, his message really was, he kept saying, go forward, go forward. He wanted them to take on a man. He wasn't happy with them going laterally. And I think he'd be disappointed with the last minute of the game when Meade had the ball in those positions and weren't able to get a shot away. They didn't. I, I think it's criminal when it's deep into injury time and you have a chance to win the game if you can get a shot away and you don't force someone to foul you or you don't take a shot on. I just, I don't like that at all. And just another flip of what maybe the way Mead are kind of setting up this year. It's really interesting. Leash had a free when the draw was, uh, when the game was level, about maybe a minute or two into injury time. And uh, it was it was about around the middle of the park, I'd say. It was a cynical enough foul uh, at the time because Leash had a bit of momentum. But Mead had four forwards up behind him. So they only had like 10 players behind the ball. You know the way everyone retreats back at that stage of a game? So it's obviously a mantra that um, it's obviously a mantra that O'Rourke is going with, that we're going to keep players up regardless. Now, you'll get your eyes open fairly quick. You'll get your eyes open fairly quickly to that. And I think Parik Joyce did. Uh, and the fantasy way, maybe, that he wanted Galway to play at the start turned into a bit more of a reality of what we actually need to do in a game. And maybe that'll happen, Colin O'Rourke, as well. But they were definitely trying to be fairly attack-minded. Um, it was dour enough stuff now, I have to say. It was dour enough. 
Yeah, um, and was that a black card foul at the end? The, the cynical one you mentioned. I uh, don't. I don't think it. I don't think a black card was given. Actually, I was standing behind the goals at this stage because I wanted to get. Owen Lowry was making some really good runs inside, and you can only see it when you're behind the goals. He was making like seven or eight false runs to eventually get the ball. And it, I think it was, it was just fascinating to look at. And I was trying to get a good gawk on and even get a look at the press that uh, Leash were putting on Harry Hogan's kickouts when they really need the ball. And it was a fascinating thing to look at. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it might have just been, it might have just been, a, I don't know what it was, but it was definitely, definitely sucked any momentum Leash had at the time anyway, without a doubt. But a, a very intentional foul to slow down the play. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. It looked like they were going to get a break. It looked like they were going to no. get a break. Number one, it's further a reminder that not enough things are considered. Like, there are cynical fouls where you hold somebody up and don't drag them all the way to the ground that are just as uh, just about merit a, a black card as much as anything else. They don't get it. And again, that foul was done to stop scoring. So again, give a penalty. They'll probably pop it over the bar. But if you knew that that was the penalty for, for a cynical tackle like that in the middle of the field, you would never do it, and it would stamp this nonsense out again. Uh, also, Offaly beat uh, Wicklow, 1-9 to 1-7. Anton Sullivan with the goal there. Uh, Fossa beat Castletown. So, David Clifford, he's into an All-Ireland final. Six points from play, and he popped over a free as well. So, that'll be, I'd say, everyone will be looking forward to that final against Stewardstown Harps, who beat Clifton of Galway after extra time, 1-13 to 1-9. And the mechanic just on that chain, just on just on David Clifford as well. Like you know, the the pitch invasions are now like a, it's a weekly or you know bi monthly thing that you see now every time Foster are playing. It's not mad to think that. And I know Carol Kane did a, a piece on it last week for the Irish News. The one game where there will not be a pitch invasion, our kids won't be able to get near him, is the All Ireland final, the biggest yeah. occasion of them all. Um, and I know Carol wrote saying it kind of took a bit, took takes some of the. I don't know, is it, I don't know, the kind of raw passion and that, you know, just being able to run on and, you know, greet whoever it is after a game or whatever. Um, now, I thought it was mad the other day. The whistle was barely gone and there was 100 people on top of him. Uh, it was it was nuts. I, someone wrote to me there saying that he must have carpal tunnel from all the, all the signing he's doing with a pen. But it was mad. It's mad to see the, the draw he has. There it is. Like he's barely shook hands with his with his direct opponent, and he is swamped. Ah, it is mad. Like to, to be honest, I'd say there's part of him that's like because there won't be that uh, invasion in the final. At least he can get around and celebrate with his uh, teammates because he probably didn't get to celebrate with his teammates until a half an hour later when you know all the buzz was gone. Now it's great to have the kids in there and all that kind of stuff, but there's two sides to it. I'd say very difficult on a, on a day when you don't win, when kids mm. don't really know or realise they just want to meet their hero or whatever. I think he was fairly well swamped after the Sigerson final this year. Nearly, I think, is that the only game he lost this year? I think nearly. Uh, it's pretty much the only game he lost. Um, but yeah, his dream year continues. The one thing I'd ask is, if you were Jack O'Connor, what would that, that final is on next Saturday or Sunday, one of the days, what would you do with David Clifford when would David Clifford hit the pitch with you again? And when would he play a competitive game for you again? Probably the last league game. Because you know that they're gonna you know that they're gonna do quite well in Monster. They're look, they're gonna probably win Monster. Cork might put up a bit of a fight, some of the other teams might have a pop, but they're gonna win Monster. So he gets two to three games in Monster, a final league game. Like, how long is it gonna take him to get sharp? Not that long at all. So I think just he needs a bit of a rest. I mean, who am I to say whether he needs a rest or not? But he, it has been a taxing year on him. So it would make sense to give him a few games off. And it gives you a chance to give more lads, um, I suppose, put a bit of responsibility on their shoulders in the meantime in the league and see how they react. What would you do? Um, I'd say back on the pitch, what are we looking at? It'd be mid-January by the time the club is over. I'd probably give him a month off training Probably have him back on the pitch with Kerry mid to late February. I'll give him Valentine's Day. Uh, I'll give him till after Valentine's Day. <laughs> and I'd probably have him back playing league around round four, something like that, maybe. Yeah. yeah maybe okay. coming on and maybe coming on in a game or two. But I think it's so um there'll be a lot of experts telling Jack O'Connor, I'm sure, what he should and shouldn't do with him. But it's so careful, they have to be so careful with how to manage him. I definitely would be erring on your side rather than the early side. I'll put it to you that way. 
Even yeah. though I'm sure he'll want to come back, though, because that's the nature, that's who, that's the way he is, and he'll want to play. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder, brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code RGAME, you'll get 15% off. The final few fixtures over the weekend, Dr. McKenna Cup, down beat Donny Gall 214 to 110. So down seemed to be playing some good stuff under Conor Laverty. Fermanagh won four, Derry 11 points. I did believe Derry had a very, very strong team out, like a huge amount of the players who played in the All Ireland semi final. And Cavan beat Antrim 210 to nine points there. So another defeat for Andy McEntee uh, as he starts his reign with Antrim. Right. You know what time it is, don't you? <laughs> it's the time that forever we have not prepared for. I'm going to make David Moran my go to the week in football because of that performance and uh, defiance uh, through defeat. You've done me there. Do your hurling on as well there, will you, while I think on, think on, try and think when I'm sitting down here. Well, I've done myself as well because I took no time to think this one through. It's just all of a sudden, here we are, and uh, you just end up knowing that you have to do this. Um, oh, hurling. Who would I give it to in hurling? Um, I don't know. So... I'm just looking at who did a bit of scoring. Martin McManus scored two goals for for Galway against uh, Westmead. So how about I give it to him? I'm going to do, instead of goat of the week, I'm going to do goat of the generation. And I'm going to give it to Lee Keegan. That is such a cop-out. And lick our smooth <laughs> as well at the same time. Um, I can't, there was no one, there was no goat in the Kilkenny Offaly game. Um and there was no goal. I, I give it to Evan O'Carroll, who was brilliant for Leash the other day and probably one of the main reasons they got a result out of that game. Yeah, we, we need actually to get people commenting on who they think the goal of the week is. We'll have to start asking earlier in the episodes. Uh, Decky Dalton, goal of the week, says Conor yeah, Heaney. Good, good to see yeah. him back in action. Someone asked earlier, did Mark Keane get through uh, the game at Cork? He played the whole game at Cork against Kerry the other night, which I thought was interesting. So I'm hoping he came in, he, he came home on skate and he's he's good to go for Valley Gibbon at the weekend. Yeah, so that's it for the show today. If you want to get the audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. There's a load of coaching uh, videos up there, lots of exclusive content. Uh, as I said, brought to you by orgoretro.com. And we'll be back again on Thursday. Michael, take her handy. And if you get her handy, take her twice. See you, Shannon. <laughs>